Come to me, all you who labour, and I will give you rest. We all need rest. It's part of the way God has created us. When St. John Paul II once reflected, man ought to imitate God both in working and also in resting. Since God himself wished to present his own creative activity under the form of work and rest. The alternation between work and rest, built into human nature, is willed by God himself. God designed us to need rest. Constant busyness and stress are bad for us. Now, we all know too well. In a sense, it makes us less human. We are composed of both body and soul. And therefore, our rest must nourish both body and soul. Most evenings before I go to bed, I watch an episode of some TV show or streaming services that I subscribe to. Homeland, or House of Cards, Billions, or Suits, or Mosh, that's the one I've been watching at the moment. You name it, pretty much if it's a drama, I've watched it. And it's a simple thing that most of us do, which helps us wind down at the end of the day, in a sense, to disconnect us from the busyness of the day and get ready for the, the change of pace of sleep. But there have been many occasions when even after I watched two or three episodes, sometimes later to the evening, I still don't feel properly rested. I don't feel properly peaceful. And it shows us, I think, that many of the things we do to rest, rest our body or our mind, but not our soul. The most important rest we need is spiritual rest. There are many ways that we can rest our body, but only the presence of the Lord gives rest to our soul. And it's in the sacrament of baptism, which all of us have received, but because all, most of us receive it as children or as infants, it's not so it doesn't figure so prominently in our mind and in our relationship with the Lord. But it's the sacrament of baptism that fills our soul with the presence of God, who dwells in us by grace. In his letter to the Christians of Rome, which we heard today, St. Paul explains that God lives within them. Your interests are not in the unspiritual, but in the spiritual. Since the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, has made his home in you. And he makes the same point when he writes to the Christians in Corinth. Do you know, do you not know, that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? We're so familiar with speaking about the fact that the Lord is present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the most holy Eucharist. But in a similar way, God is also present in our soul. And this interior presence of God in our soul is the foundation of spiritual rest. This was what St. Augustine learned after so many years of seeking rest and pleasure in the world around him, outside his soul, if you like. As he wrote in his Confessions, Our hearts are restless until they rest in you, O Lord. Jesus explains that we find rest by shouldering his yoke. Not an egg yoke. That just makes a mess. In the ancient world, a yoke was a load-bearing tool. 
It consists of a curved beam which was laid across the back of the neck and across the shoulders. And it would have chains or ropes to hold things hanging down from the sides. And the whole point of a yoke, and it's a bit counterintuitive, but the point of the yoke was that it made a heavy burden easier to bear because it had distributed the load evenly. So although you're actually adding a weight to your shoulders by carrying a piece of wood, it makes a heavy burden lighter. And so in Israel, that yoke became an image for the Torah, the law of God. For them, living according to God's law helped to lighten the burden of life, just as a yoke helps to lighten the physical burden. And Jesus explains the yoke he offers is even more effective than the yoke of the old law. Rather than simply lightening the load of life, Jesus' yoke actually gives us rest. Pope Benedict reflects, Jesus offers us his yoke, the way of the wisdom of the gospel, which is neither a doctrine to be learned nor an ethical system, but a person to follow. He himself is the yoke, the only begotten Son, in perfect communion with the Father. We find rest in relationship with the Lord. And so Jesus invites us to learn from him how to rest. The times he lived a frenetic life. We know from all those different scenes in the gospel that sometimes people were clawing at him, literally grabbing his clothes, that he wanted to run away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and they chased him around, a bit like a sort of Monty Python episode or something. You can just imagine Jesus and the crowds running him around and around the lake. All he wanted to do was go into the mountains to rest. He lived a frenetic life, and yet he maintained continual interior peace because he maintained continual interior union with his Father. So I think there are three aspects of the Lord's life that can help us cultivate this same spiritual rest. And they are silence, solitude, and prayer. Our culture is saturated with noise because it's saturated with technology. And that's not to say technology is entirely bad. But one of the effects is that our culture is saturated with noise. Constant noise actually makes the interior life, deep relationship with God, constant, continual relationship with God, impossible. Constant noise actually makes it impossible. Cardinal Robert Sarah is the uh, prefect of the Congregation for, the, for Divine Worship. And he wrote a beautiful book recently called The Power of Silence. And there he writes, Our world no longer hears God because it is constantly speaking. A bit like Father Marcus. <laughs> speaking at a devastating speed and volume in order to say nothing. Modern civilization does not know how to be quiet. Christ lived 30 years in silence. Then during his public life, he withdrew to the desert to listen to and speak with his Father. God speaks in silence. Our culture may be saturated with noise, but that does not mean we have to live with noise as well. There are so many opportunities throughout our day when we stop and actually think where we can intentionally build silence into our day. So often I find myself, as soon as I wake up, pray a morning offering, and then I'll hit the, um, the radio app on my phone, 
And as I get ready for the day, you know, half an hour, whatever that it takes to get ready, I'm listening to the radio. And it's a sort of bad habit that I'm trying to break because I know that that first half an hour of the day can sort of set the tone if I go about those activities in silence. And so whether it's waking up in the morning or going to bed at night, whether it's when we exercise or when we drive or catch public transport or do different chores or activities throughout the house, these are so many of the times where we can actually build silence into our day. Silence helps us spiritually rest because it enables us more easily to hear God. And then the solitude. Solitude is not the same as loneliness, which we can feel whether we're in a crowd or not. We can feel alone when we're on our own, or we can feel alone in a crowd. Time after time, we see the Lord withdrawing from human company so that he can devote himself to his Father. Solitude means withdrawing from human company so that we can devote ourselves to the company of God. And the analogy to marriage always works so well with the spiritual life. Imagine living in a marriage where you never actually were only together as husband and wife. And that's one of the real challenges of family life. But when you don't actually have regular time to spend together, only the two of you, your relationship suffers. And that's what solitude does for our relationship with God. It's sort of like date night. <laughs> it's not an empty space, a void. It's an encounter with the God who lies within. It's like a, a love space wherein the mystery of God awaits us. And so like silence, solitude is a vehicle for rest because it enables us more easily to encounter God. And in silence and solitude, prepare the way for prayer because they help us discover that God lies within us. Prayer is communion with God who dwells within us. And it can take the form of words or simply gentle attention to his interior presence. There's a beautiful uh, story from the life of St. John Vianney, who's the patron saint of priests. And one day he walked into his church and there was a fellow who used to sit at the back of the church every day, all day. And one day, St. John Vianney thought, I'm going to go and talk to this fellow and ask him what he's about. And he said to him, what are you doing? He knew what he was, he knew he was praying, but he wanted to hear it from the man. And the man said to him, I look at him, and he looks at me. No words required. Just simply that gentle attention to the presence of the Lord. And we can do that not only when we're before the Blessed Sacrament, but at all times, because the Lord is sacramentally present within us through baptism. And so in every moment of the day, the Lord is waiting within us, inviting us to rest in his presence through prayer. Silence, solitude, prayer. These three practices are hallmarks of the life of our Lord. They helped him find constant rest in his Father, even in the busiest of times. Come to me, all you who labour and are overburdened, he says, and I will give you rest. Shoulder my yoke and learn from me, and you will find rest for your souls.